We are deeply complicit. These are our bombs, our fighter jets, your tax dollars that are paying for this calamity, for this genocide. The United States government and Israel are leading a military political crusade, if you will, to impose political Zionist ideology in the Middle East. The consequences are dire, not only for ourselves and our own standing in the world, but people are dying. People are dying who don't have to be dying right now. Thank all of you for sharing your Saturday with us on, on this critical conversation. Uh, I also want to thank uh, LA County for partnering with us on LA versus Hate uh, and their support for our uh, Countering Hate Crimes uh, program. And you know, for anybody who needs, to, needs more information or report a crime or, or report a hate incident that does not necessarily need to be a crime, uh, it's an easy way of contacting them. You just dial 211. Uh, this panel, I'm very, very excited uh, to uh, moderate. Uh, we have two very special people, and I assure you, you will not be able to find this combination anywhere. Not on CNN, uh, definitely not on Fox News. Uh, maybe on uh, Zateo or Al Jazeera, we'll see, I don't know, but, but uh, this, is, this is a live conversation, and we have two uh, real experts. Sometimes you meet people in government, and they say, yeah, I'm an expert on uh, the Middle East, and you know, maybe they read a book, uh, and that's about it. They don't, know the, they don't know the political landscape, they don't know the religious landscape, they don't know the cultural distinctions, uh, and yet they're the ones in charge of our foreign policy in the Middle East. So uh, we need some real expertise, and part of MPAC's objective is to do exactly that. And by the way, it doesn't necessarily need to be Muslims who need to be in that position. It just needs to be somebody who's competent, who understands, and, uh, and who's willing to engage communities here and abroad on these issues. And we have a, a treasure uh, of expertise, a wealth of expertise here in America. It's called the American Muslim community uh, and Arab American community and people who live and understand if they can just be engaged more by our officials and policymakers, I think that would do America a lot of good. Uh, I want to thank all of you, and especially the students here who are taking their time on Saturday to be with us, uh, and, um, and, and we look forward to your uh, engagement, further engagement <clears throat> beyond this panel. I'm going to have our, our panelists say a little bit about themselves. Uh, I'll just give you their titles. Uh, Summer Ali is Research Professor of Political Science and Law at Vanderbilt. Yeah, you can give her an applause. Yeah. <laughs> Summer Ali. Thank you. She's research professor of political science and law at Vanderbilt University um, and founder of Millions of Conversations, uh, which I believe is a dialogue group and uh, exactly what it says, trying to create more conversations about these very important issues. And to her left uh, is Josh Paul. He's... <laughs> and he's a non-resident fellow at... Uh, DON, uh, which stands for Democracy in the Arab World Now, um, which is a new media outlet, I believe. And, and it's it's an, an advocacy group in Washington, Advocacy DC, group. Yeah. Um, and I believe they're, one of their staff people is here, too. Ramin, who's a good friend of ours, and former... Yes, give him a round of applause. <laughs> um, and Josh uh, is also known, uh, if you follow the news, as the person who resigned as director in the Political Military Bureau at the State Department in protest of the policy in Gaza and what's happening in the Middle East. So uh, I'll just let you uh, open up, uh, uh, say a little bit more about yourselves and your work and how it relates to national security policy, and then we'll get into... Uh, Hopefully, part of the million conversations. Well, we're coming up on your anniversary of resignation, so I insist that you go first. All right, fine. No, thank you. Um, yeah, it's a strange uh, anniversary, um, and and unfortunately, for all the you know all the right reasons and all the wrong reasons. Uh, but I worked in the State Department Bureau of Political Military Affairs for almost a dozen years uh, until last October, when I resigned over this administration's approach uh, to expediting uh, the transfer of lethal arms to Israel in the context of its attacks on Gaza. Uh, that was October 18th of last year. Already by then, over 3,500 Palestinians had been killed. 
Uh, I didn't imagine then that we would still be sitting here a year later and the bombs would still be dropping, and not just dropping on Gaza, uh, but dropping on Lebanon as well now, uh, with, of course, as well, the escalation of violence that we see in the West Bank uh, and the risks of a regional war. Um, so since leaving the State Department, I have been essentially focusing entirely on advocacy on this issue, uh, trying to educate the American people about uh, our role in this, because we are deeply complicit. These are our bombs, our fighter jets, your tax dollars uh, that are paying for this calamity, for this genocide. Um, and so have been, have been working to educate and also uh, to try and continue to push the US government uh, to shift its approach. And I know that there are so many of us who have been trying through so many different uh, formats to do that and, and have been very proud to have done that for the last year or so. Yeah, thank you. I also just want to say a big thank you to Impact as well. Um, you all have been doing amazing work for decades now, and it's really, truly an honor to be here and to be here as a guest in LA County. So thank you all. And um, just to add a little bit, I guess, about my background, I've worked in the government and I've worked outside of the government. I've worked in the private sector and the public sector. Um, I've uh, visited and or worked in 65 countries around the world um, as an international lawyer who's working at the intersection of national security, human rights, and economic development. And I think one of the heartbeats of this panel discussion, and this is part of the interview that I read of yours that you did about a year ago in The Nation, um, what is about can you have national security without a full-on respect for human rights? And human rights also means civil rights. And so I really study that at its core um, and, 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 and think about what would it take to actually realize positive peace rather than what we call negative peace. Negative peace is when you might try a violent campaign of where you try to push a peace deal through that's top down through violence, and it doesn't hold. Positive peace is where you have the ground up coming, you have a robust civil society, um, you have a healthy human rights dynamic intersecting with this national security apparatus that also requires a road, a road towards a healthy economy as well, um, of where policymakers also meet the grassroots organizers where they are at so they can realize a sustainable pathway to peace moving forward for hopefully decades and centuries to come. That's excellent. Thank you. Um, uh, you know, national security has been invoked, uh, and from you know, from people who just follow the events, it's usually invoked uh, for the wrong reasons. Uh, national security was invoked in, during the Gulf War, uh, the two Gulf Wars. We had to do it for the sake of national security. National security was invoked uh, in the internment of Japanese Americans. And there's a famous Supreme Court case, Korematsu, uh, where a gentleman, last name Korematsu, filed a petition in the Supreme Court, had a hearing, and the executive branch came in and said, well, we had to do it out of national security, and the Supreme Court deferred to the executive branch and said it has, that the Supreme Court had no say in it, therefore the, the, the government won in, in that case. Um, national security was invoked by Donald Trump when he... Uh, issued the travel ban uh, on several Muslim-majority countries um, because of the fear of Muslim immigrants coming in uh, and increasing the, the threat and risk uh, of terrorism, uh, it, purportedly. So w how are we looking at national security then purely from a policy lens with the intersection of human rights, and it's really... At, you know, it's achieving security uh, globally, regionally, and for us here in America, or is it just a political card that's used by the government to basically get away with whatever it wants to do? That's, that's quite the opening question. Um, so I think that there is such a thing as national security, uh, but very much it begins at home. And I think that particularly in what is intended to be a pluralistic democratic, multicultural society, um, when we have that gap at home, when we are not uh, addressing ourselves holistically, when we are not looking at our own issues of civil rights, 
we are never going to be able to translate that successfully into an outward-looking foreign policy that is actually in the American national security because we will fail from the start to define what the American national security is. If we are defining it just from an establishment perspective, just from a perspective of a particular ethnicity, race, faith, whatever it might be, then everything that flows from that uh, in the international field, in the security relations field, is going to be fundamentally flawed. And I think that brings us very abruptly to the topic of this panel, which is you know, Muslim hate, anti-Muslim hate, uh, Islamophobia in America, and its nexus to America's foreign policy failings. Because we start, I think, in that context with, um, first of all, a historic bias within the American system against Islam and othering uh, of Islam that, that, you know, in many ways predates even the founding of the nation, uh, whether it is in the context, as our previous panelists were discussing, uh, of the importation of Islam in the first place in the form of slaves coming from Africa, uh, or whether it is in the adoption of what is actually a very flawed and, you know, um, failed understanding of what America's own and the West's, right, own cultural heritage is. There's this concept of Western heritage, uh, and they talk about Greece and Rome uh, and all this sort of thing, but forget that our math, our medicine, these are all intertwined. These come from the Middle East. These come from uh, Muslim countries and Muslim cultures. Uh, and so that is set aside. And then there is an addition, and particularly in the national security sector, uh, this focus on this, you know, Christianist identity, um, which has now bled into what they call this sort of Judeo-Christian framing, right? Uh, but that, for example, holds up the Crusades uh, as the the epitome of uh, what it is to be a warrior, right? To the extent that not only is there this sort of broad understanding and identity uh, that associates itself, you know, we talk about, you know, crusading, uh, but the U.S. Army itself, actually, when it was developing its next generation uh, artillery piece, called it the Crusader. Um, so this is all deeply intertwined into uh, the establishment psychology, I would say, uh, compounded, again, by this othering, which creates this idea of uh, a homogenous Islam. Again, going back to the last panel's remarks, uh, we know how diverse the Muslim community is in this country and around the world. Uh, and yet, America, rather than, you know, you see all these, when, when they do demographic analysis or you see public polls of what do Americans think about politics, uh, and they'll break it down by, okay, uh, here's Catholics, Lutherans, Methodists, Mormons, um, and Muslims, right? And, and so there is, the, right there, this, this lack of acknowledgement and understanding of the diversity of the community, um, which then, again, I think, layers itself on our foreign policy. So, so last, last thing on this is that when we then look at foreign policy challenges where there is a Muslim community involved, we tend to forget about the rest of the complexity and the local complexity and the political complexity and focus instead on that Muslim presence as a cover. So it sort of conflates everything. So Palestine being an example, uh, you know, we forget or America, most Americans, if you ask them, they don't know that the oldest Christian community in the world is present in Palestine, is being bombarded by Israel in Gaza, is being, uh, you know, uh, living under apartheid in um, Bethlehem. Um, and yet, there's this sort of picture that is painted that, oh, no, 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 it's all America versus Islam from Afghanistan to Palestine to Nigeria with and a sort of depoliticization where we forget about the underlying conflicts, the underlying complexities, the root causes, and instead paper it all over. So, so that is one of the many ways in which I think bigotry at home leads to failed national security policy overseas. Yeah, um, you know, I, I think you you hit the nail on the head with regards to national security being here at home and also overseas. I think sometimes we wrongly bifurcate this as domestic policy versus foreign policy as if they're completely two different things that are not related. And um, I think that they absolutely are related. And also that goes to back to our values, which I hope to touch on a little bit more 
um, later on, but what are the underlying values that are supporting the policy making that's happening? And I think that we have seen this detachment and this divorce from our values for the past at least 24 years. And I believe like in there before that, there was at least for a period of time this commitment to try to get on a track of where our foreign policy was anchored in some core democratic values that the United States recognized in our own constitution. And then that just sort of completely um, was was almost as if just sort of um, done away with um, in the blink of an eye. And we also can't forget Homeland Security um, was was formed 20 years ago almost now, and that also took a different take on how we think about national security at home and Homeland Security and its relationship to that and the place there where Muslims are in that paradigm and in that apparatus. Um, and what I would say is what I have found is that, uh, is that really our national security apparatus has been politicized. And in some instances, it has been weaponized. Um, and for some people with certain identities um, that I share um, some identities with as well, um, it's been our identities have been criminalized um, to, by how people are relating to what your identity means and the meaning that they've assigned to your identity. And so then therefore you might become a person who is suspicious. And that suspicious environment, that cloud, if you will, of suspicion, is what has eroded what I think is the Arab American and Muslim American society in America now for quite some time. And it's very unhealthy for a whole host of reasons, including that it's lost opportunity, quite frankly, for us to live in a, in a healthy, pluralistic way as a society that's becoming a minority, minority majority country, all of us. And I think also this was alluded to in the first panel, thank you, Sue, and that the Muslim American community as well is a minority majority community. So we're actually a case study of how you can build consensus in a community that might be a roadmap um, for the rest of the country too. But I won't go down that road too much further because that takes us away from this national security specific conversation piece here. But I will just say, because you touched on it, who is being, you hear a lot of national, when you hear national security, one of the things that you think of if you're an everyday person is um, safety, is being um, protected, perhaps, is being, uh, your, your, your surrounding being secure. But I think we have to think about that being secure from whom and whose safety is being prioritized. And what I oftentimes find is that there's this um, there's this us versus them um, hardline mentality when we think about national security, rather than thinking about the whole of society. So, are do we deserve as Muslim Americans, as Arab Americans, to also feel safe? And I'm going somewhere with this. Do um, is our security and safety just as important as everyone else, or? Is it secondary? When we talk about police officers, do we know that the New England uh, definition, dictionary's definition of police officer is officer of the peace? Why do we not use that language when we talk about national security and safety and considerations? I'm also following what's happening on UCLA's campus right now, where we're sitting right now with regards to what's happening um, in relationship to people with the officers of the peace. And then just to finalize on this note here, uh, going back to whose security are we protecting and whose feelings of safety are we prioritizing here, I want to talk about for, for a second the United We Stand Summit that the White House hosted two years ago now where it announced that there was going to be this robust national policy to counter Islamophobia. I'll touch on the word Islamophobia later and why I don't think that's the right word for us to use as we to address anti-Muslim racism. But for now, I'm just quoting directly what the White House said that it was going to do. In the same time, it also said it was going to stand up to hate and it was going to fight anti-Semitism um, as well with a robust national policy to counter anti-Semitism, which we absolutely welcome. We're two years later sitting here now. There is no national policy that has been released on countering Islamophobia, and it's not coming any time soon. 
And we have to ask the question as why. Good. Yes. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, and we're, we're going we're gonna to dive into that a little more. Uh, but before we get to that, could you touch upon you know, what our current national security policies are with respect to Muslim-majority countries? What's the relationship between the United States and, uh, and these countries? And how is it impacting sentiment about the United States itself, uh, American sentiment? Um, and should that, is that something that is part of the calculus in developing national security policy? So I, I think there are a few things there to pick apart, right? I mean, we have, first of all, this horrific 24 years of the quote-unquote global war on terror uh, and the implications that that has carried for both civil society, Muslim society here in America, and U.S. relationships with Muslim communities around the world. Uh, obviously, in this moment, we as well have, and we've had for, for many years, but particularly now, uh, this U.S.-Israel relationship uh, in which we are, for some reason, we, our policymakers, our leaders have decided that our national security is inextricably linked with that of Israel. And I think it's important to take that into account. First of all, just to, to go back to something uh, someone was just saying uh, about national security and foreign policy actually being a product of domestic politics. Um, and I think that, you know, when people say to me, you know, people ask the question very often, uh, what is the national security benefit of this relationship they have? What is the strategic benefit that we are getting out of this relationship with Israel? And I think it's very hard to identify one in terms of a foreign policy interest. Uh, it is very easy to identify one in terms of a domestic political interest. And I think, to be fair, right, let's be clear that as a democracy, uh, it should certainly be the case that, you know, active U.S. citizens can shape the way our foreign policy works. Uh, but what we have now is a foreign policy that actually runs in the face of that national interest. And you see that directly in terms of its implications for U.S. relations uh, with much of the Muslim world. Uh, where, for example, so, so you ask what, are, what is the U.S. foreign policy in this regard, uh, we find ourselves actually, you know, and this goes to the breakdown between our values and our policies, uh, our values are democracy, freedom, and yet uh, we increasingly find ourselves on the other side of that equation. We increasingly find ourselves pursuing stability uh, over democracy. In fact, favoring autocrats over democratic trends because those democratic trends, uh, you know, fall against us in some cases, or uh, we identify you know, with, frankly, with Islam. In, in many countries in the Middle East, we see that, you know, there are autocrats, there are rulers who are on side, who are willing to repress their populations uh, in order to retain and maintain their relationships with us, uh, which gets harder and harder the more that we go down this road in which Israel is expanding its conflicts, we are providing the assistance to Israel, and so there becomes this vicious cycle uh, in which, in order to pursue our quote-unquote national security, we have to oppose uh, democratization. So that is one aspect, but of course we also see this playing out, uh, not just in the Middle East, right? We see this playing out uh, in, for example, Southeast Asia, uh, where a year ago, so this is a uh, foreign affairs uh, journal reported this just last month, uh, there was a poll done in the summer of 2023 of a number of Muslim countries in Southeast Asia, including Brunei, Indonesia, uh, and I think Malaysia, uh, of what is your um, you know, major power of choice to be partnered with. And a majority in those polls over a year ago uh, said the United States. They went back uh, a couple of months ago and did the polls again, asked the same questions, and this time large majorities in the, each of those countries said China. And when you look at the polls, another question that was asked in the same poll is, what is the most important foreign policy issue for you right now? And the answer was Gaza. So I think we can see very clearly how the approach that we are taking undermines our relationship with the Muslim world, does so in a manner that is cyclical, that leads to deeper and deeper uh, misunderstandings and, and damage to those relationships and, you know, ultimately runs against our own national security and our values. Thank you. Yeah, perfectly summarized. Yeah. Um, then, you know, in terms of national security policy, what are the uh, opportunities, if, if any, for reform? Uh, yeah, we heard in general, you know, we need to engage, we can engage on this issue from a domestic political 
uh, approach. Uh, but what else can we be thinking about in terms of reforming national security that will end up making it, making us feel safe? Because right now, I don't think anybody feels safe. Israelis don't feel safe. Definitely, we don't feel safe. Um, and I don't think it's good for America. I think anti-American sentiment is is at an all-time high, not just in the in the region, but throughout the world. I mean, people are walking out uh, of talks uh, in the UN by Benjamin Netanyahu, who is who is, who is now attached to this policy. Um, so how how can we look at the issue of reforming U.S. national security policy? Well, I think we need to think about this in terms of short term, right now even between now and the election, which is three weeks away, basically, and then medium term and then long term. And I have thought about this a lot, and I cannot think of a single pathway forward that does not involve a um, realignment with what we consider to be democratic values and American values and doing what we say and saying what we mean. Um, because people, we're also seeing a trust deficit in our own country between Americans and democracy and our government, which is attributed to a couple of different things, um, including this feeling of hypocrisy and corruption. When you see hypocrisy and you see corruption, that is a very clear indication that you are um, um, veering off and you do not have an alignment with democratic values. And so I actually wrote down for this 10 values that I think are absolutely key, um, and I'll read them off in just a second. Um, but I think that any national security policy measures that we propose need to be consistent. They need to be um, fairly um, applicable and within the same ethos as what we're asking for domestically as what we're also asking for outside of our nation's borders. I think that's one of the pathways of how we're going to get respect for ourselves back and also respect um, for each other and and to attract um, um, international respect as well. And it goes back to a path that we were trying to get on a couple of years ago that we just completely, I think, just abandoned, um, and that is a rules-based international order. Um, yes, no, it's a rules-based international order because that's that's a very important um, frame of where people can feel as if they're at least operating um, with a rule book that democracies are trying to respect and equally apply. And this gets back to the point that you were just making a moment ago. But these are the values um, that I think, at least the top 10 values that I would say, the first is equality, and that separate can never mean equal. I grew up in the in the South, um, of, in Tennessee, um, which for decades um, was governed by uh, was was known as the Jim Crow South. And there was the Supreme Court that you mentioned the Supreme uh, Supreme Court case. There's another Supreme Court case called Brown versus Board of Education, of where we decided that it was not going to be tolerated that that the, the separate but equal doctrine. So separate can never mean equal. And so therefore, I think that is a very key value in a, an American democracy that we need to hold close to in all of our policy making decisions, both domestic and foreign policy. And that includes what we determine to be an ally, a democratic ally, the, some, another democracy that we call a democracy. Calling another country a democracy is also something that's, that we shouldn't just, I think, just hand out because it's convenient. And just because they were a democracy yesterday doesn't mean they're a democracy today. We, and that goes to, that, that's the same, and we have to apply the same standards to ourselves. The second tier is freedom of, of speech and freedom of the press, also very important. The third is due process of law. Um, when there's been a crime that's been, I'm a lawyer by trade, as I mentioned, when there's a crime that's been committed, one of the things is that you gather evidence, you don't immediately issue <laughs> a verdict, um, and you have a due process of law, and you have something called presumed innocent, innocent until proven guilty. There is a process. We don't just abandon it. This also gets back to why I've always been against extrajudicial killings for so many reasons, and also in this environment that's riddled with disinformation and misinformation, having um, our government be quick to make conclusions when it doesn't yet have all the information to be doing so. Um, the fourth is to protect um, innocent people and civilians. The fifth is honesty and transparency. This is very important. Um, sixth is to respect human dignity. 
um, and, and thinking about what that means in the 21st century. Um, the seventh is accountability for wrongdoing and that accountability piece, which is important. Eighth is the fair application of the law and fairness in general. Nine is proportionate consequences for action. This gets the justice, fairness, and mercy concept in law. And then lastly, um, education and an informed citizenry. We are facing an information ecosystem, like I mentioned, that is um, being challenged right now. So it's imperative for our democracy for us to figure out how to make sure that um, clear and accurate and fact-based um, information is reaching people in real time so that we can make, in a democracy, responsible decisions, especially at the ballot box. Thanks. No, I think I think that's a, a fantastic list of the values and that we need to return to if if indeed we ever truly embodied them. You know, I, I think that really there are two roads here, right? There's there's the easy way and the hard way. And the easy way, and it's not an easy way at all, right? But is for the United States to realize the harm that we are doing to ourselves within ourselves as a nation and the harm that we are doing around the world and to adjust our policies and move in a better direction towards the, you know, a rules-based order, uh, which includes, you know, will require some compromises on our part, uh, for example, in terms of giving up some power, in terms of being willing uh, to yield ourselves uh, to international accountability mechanisms, uh, like the International Criminal Court, like the International Court of Justice. Uh, the other route is, is the hard route, and, and, but it comes back to that same question of accountability. Whether that accountability is direct individual accountability uh, for violations of that international rules-based order, violations of uh, any sort of moral or ethical code, violations of our own laws, which is lacking right now, uh, or it is the accountability uh, that comes through reputational harm and the damage that we are doing to our credibility around the world, uh, or it is the accountability that comes through a collapse of that rules-based international order uh, and a world that is thrust once more into great power competition, conflict, and chaos. Uh, one way or another, unless we address these things... Is that what we're things, in right now? We're getting there. I think one way or another, right, accountability comes for us all in all of those ways unless we can take the steps necessary to avoid it. Thank you. Uh, and I think what we're saying is that we need to shift national security to uh, a security of the people and that the state should serve the people's needs, not vice versa, where the people are serving the state's needs to the point that we can sacrifice hundreds of thousands of people in the Middle East to serve uh, a particular policy, which is what is happening now. Um, and in this particular case, it, it is about, I mean, basically what's happening is that the United States government and Israel are leading a military, political uh, crusade, if you will, to impose political Zionist ideology in the Middle East. And for those Muslim countries who are okay with it or more uh, accurately are not going to get in the way of it, then they're the good Muslim. And for those that are going to resist, they're the bad Muslim. And we're going to unleash the national security apparatus uh, and the military apparatus against them there. And, we, and, and those who disagree will have their civil liberties uh, compromised here. Uh, just this week, I, I heard of another case where somebody, someone's organization's bank account was closed, yeah. uh, which, again, it's, the, it's this notion of if you're not with us, you're against us, and we're going to close your bank accounts, we're going to disrupt your travel, you're going to be you know, presumed guilty uh, before presumed innocent, and so on and so forth. And, and so... When it comes, so the real issue then in terms of foreign policy, national security policy, it's all tied to this political Zionist ideology. And Joe Biden said he's a Zionist. Uh, it, and he, he said if, if Israel wasn't around, we would create our own Israel uh, in the region. If we can um, uh, uh, take, take that sentence of what he said, what does that mean? Is that shared within the national security apparatus of the United States by whom? And what is it that they're actually trying to achieve? First of all, I would say that I think, I think to be fair, it is, it is more than just about Israel. I think uh, to take the, the first part of, of Joe Biden's statement there, if there wasn't an Israel, I think there would still be 
uh, an American issue with, you know, anti-Muslim hate that would be influencing our foreign policy. Uh, because, you know, that was an issue before uh, 1948, even before 1897, um, and I think would continue to be uh, an issue today. But, um, you know, I think when you take Joe Biden's statement about we would have to create it, first of all, I think, you know, let's be clear, I think that's actually an anti-Semitic statement before it's anything else, mm -hmm. because it is saying that Jews cannot be at home in America or elsewhere in the world. We have to create a state to put them in. So, first of all, and this is something that, you know, one of the other people uh, who resigned from government, Lily greenberg Call, who you may have heard, has been very vocal about that she feels that her faith as a Jew is being weaponized by this administration to enable uh, militarism uh, of the United States and of Israel in the Middle East. But I think it also points to, you know, this question of American empire. Are we an empire or are we not? And of course, in its own self-identity, America never sees itself as an empire. We are, you know, a shining city on the hill. Uh, we, you know, find ourselves in this awkward position of being the world's policeman and being the superpower, the hegemonic power, uh, but really we'd rather not. And I think that uh, there is as well in Joe Biden's statement there uh, a hint that maybe that's not true, that actually maybe the United States would like to uh, organize the world around its own pre premises and around its own sort of structural decision making rather than cede to the democratic preferences of regions around the world where those may not advance the U.S. interest. I think what you get in the end is actually a very fragile global system that doesn't actually advance the United States' interest in the world, and in fact, as we see now, puts it at risk. Uh, but I think that those in Washington, certainly there is a culture of desiring to control, right, of, of sitting there like children around a board game playing risk, uh, without having a deep understanding and, and a humanization, frankly, uh, of the people who are sitting in the countries around that board, what it means for them, and what that ultimately means for us. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. Uh, just uh, a follow-up to that, if you can answer. You know, it seems that the national security officials are in, are in this revolving door. They, they go back and forth. It's the same, it's the same crew pretty much over and over again. How can we disrupt that? Yeah, I mean, I think that's true. And I think there are several, there are several aspects to that, right? I mean, there is what we call in Washington the blob, right? Which is the foreign policy establishment, whether Republican or Democrat, that always sort of seems to be there. Uh, and, you know, as someone we were talking about earlier, Brett McGurk, who is now the National Security Adv uh, Council Senior Director for the Middle East, is a good example of that. He came on board, and I knew him, in uh, 2004 under the Bush administration, and he's basically been in the same position uh, with minor adjustments here or there uh, ever since, uh, through Obama, through Trump, through Biden. Um, but I think even more pernicious than the presence of certain individuals is the blob's sort of creation of an Overton window that doesn't shift or that is very hard to shift, that defines what acceptable conversation is. Uh, for example, um, you know, our support to Israel is ironclad. Uh, Israel has the right to defend itself. You will struggle, uh, at least until the last few months, to find anyone in the Washington establishment, anywhere on the political spectrum, who would say anything other than those two things. And even now, it's extremely hard. Uh, and so, to break that up, I think, I think first of all, let's, let's be, to be fair, events do break things up. Events do happen. Events do change the world that we live in. Uh, and I do think that there is now a geopolitical cost that America is paying for its unconditional support to Israel, uh, and as well the fact that Israel is going so far, frankly, off a cliff in one direction, uh, is going to shift American foreign policy in this regard in some respects. At the same time, uh, we also need to be um, intentional about this, right? The Biden administration, to its credit, uh, came into office talking about the importance of diversity, equity, inclusion, accessibility, DIA, but it turns out that while they were very good on bringing voices into government, they're not very good at listening to those voices. But the answer is not to then shun that attempt and to step back and say, well, this government isn't working, we can't trust it. It is to engage more, to get more people into those positions, to get more diverse perspectives and backgrounds into those positions uh, in order to, over time, and this is a generational shift and a generational effort, uh, shift foreign policy. And then the final thing, uh, is that there also has to be something you can't just push from the inside. You also have to be pushing from the outside. And that is where uh, all of us who care about this issue, be we Muslim, be we Arab, be we progressive, be we even Republican, uh, 
organize, organize more effectively so that our voices are not drowned out by money, by influence, but that we can get our words in the room, have our voices heard, and actually be the people making those decisions. Can I do that? It's an ecosystem. And I, and I think if there's a takeaway here, it's for everybody to think about this as an ecosystem. There's no magic wand here. Um, and, and it really is a, a multifaceted um, um, effort. And I think Sue's panel before hours touched on that as well, um, in, including also about the power of the street. Um, there is definitely a disconnect between the American street right now and elected officials on this issue and on other issues too. We're seeing it, we're feeling it. That's adding to that trust deficit that I was talking about. And how you respond to protest is also very important. It's a hallmark is what I of a democracy and, and you will be judged in terms of the health of your democracy based on how you respond to protests um, and especially coming from the street. The second thing that I would just say, we touched on a lot of different points here, and that is the the about the you asked the question about some of these people who've been in these positions for 20 years now, and that gets to that accountability piece. Have they been account held accountable for a series of failed diplomatic attempts? Are they actually diplomats? Or are they um, are something else? Um, fill in the blank. <laughs> and so, <laughs> and so uh, you know, to, to exercise diplomacy myself here. Um, but just to sort of really say here, you know, one of the because I, mean, I know we have some college students here. My favorite class in college that was the, the that was the turning point of where I decided to um, move away from being pre-med and 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 figure out a pathway to pre-law was called crisis diplomacy and it was about these critical moments and who is really good at diplomacy and who is not and I'm not quite sure we have people who have honed that craft of diplomacy in the in the positions that we need right now and so I think we've got to measure that and we have to be very clear on what um, savvy, effective diplomacy looks like in 2024 and hold people accountable to those standards. And it is different than it was before because of all the changes that have happened. I'm constantly being asked about my KPIs and if I'm meeting my KPIs. And I'm always just wondering, is are the people who were in these positions being asked about their KPIs? Because we've had a failed Iran deal, okay? We had a failed deal in Syria. We had a failed deal in Yemen. We've had a, I can go on. We've had Iraq. arguably a failed deal in Iraq. There, how many peace processes attempts have been in Afghanistan and also in Palestine is Israel, and then we've had a failed series of failed um, um, attempts in Lebanon. So I don't think the track record's that great. So are we going to keep trying to do the same thing when we know it doesn't lead to a pathway to peace? Or are we going to get people in who know what they're doing that's going to help us realize a peaceful path that's consistent with democratic values and principles? That's the question that I want to ask. Great, thank and you. I want to just say one other thing, and that yeah, yeah, yeah. is whose agenda are we serving? Because that is your question. Whose agenda are we serving? Are we serving uh, an agenda to strengthen democracy and peace, or are we serving an agenda to prolong war and that benefits conflict profiteers? Yeah, I mean, if I can just on that, I mean, I think part of the problem here as well, right, is, the, is our wealth, is our power, is our resources, uh, that we have made all these mistakes and not actually paid significant costs. If we were uh, a weaker nation, a poorer nation, a less powerful nation... Uh, each of these failures would have had powerful implications for our own domestic peace and stability, uh, but they haven't. It's been water off a duck's back. And, and I think you see this play out in how the U.S. actually works in a very sort of pragmatic context, right? So I've worked for U.S. and U.K. governments, and I can tell you that in the U.K. context, where the, there isn't anywhere near as many resources, there's a lot more assessment of KPIs because you have to be sure that the dollars you are spending are having the impact that you need them to have because there's only so many dollars or so many pounds. Mm -hmm. Whereas for the US, we are so resource rich that we throw money at a problem. Corruption. <laughs> yep. That's what that means. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Are you right? No, and, and also these national security officials, my understanding, those who work in the White House, they, they need not be confirmed uh, by the US right. Senate. They are just appointed by the administration uh, I, I recall an infamous case, I don't know if, you, if any of you remember, a guy by the name of Elliot Abrams, but during the Iran-Contra and, and all the debacles that we did in, uh, that we're responsible for in Latin America, he was actually censored and convicted 
uh, but then later pardoned, uh, and this was in the 80s, and by 2000, he came back in the White House, appointed by George uh, W. Bush as the National Security Advisor, and he was basically the lead architect for the Gulf War. So it's these kinds of people that keep creeping back in, uh, and they, there's no accountability whatsoever. And I think we, as the American people, need to be more educated about that, because that's when there will be accountabilities when we raise these issues uh, as a people. Um, but but to, to the point about, you know, we're rich, we, we have a lot of resources, my understanding, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, is we're draining hundreds of billions of dollars in these escapades, and, and uh, obviously we have lost credibility. There is no rules-based order. Everybody thinks it's a joke now. Um, is this the beginning of the demise of America as a superpower? And, and, and so how do we deal with that in terms of, uh, we're just gonna throw more military hardware, more military spending at the problem, and China and Russia are definitely gonna gain uh, 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 as superpowers, in terms of superpower status on the United States, simply because the United States has declined in terms of its superpower status. Or correct me if I'm wrong, if it, if it has at all. Well, that's the irony here. I mean, I think that what we actually need to do is make sure that we're prioritizing U.S. and national security interests. And so that means that we have to have a paradigm shift in terms of how we're measuring what are our national security interests and have an honest conversation before it's too late. And that's what we are trying to do. I mean, that's one of the reasons that why so many people now, including yourselves, on a Saturday afternoon are here talking about this because the consequences are dire, not only for ourselves and our own standing in the world, but people are dying. People are dying who don't have to be dying right now. And at what cost, as we were talking about at lunch, are uh, who's paying the cost as we figure this out? And as we figure this out, in, in this being something that's actually not serving our national security interests. So I think we've got to um, get really tight in terms of how we frame what our expectations are, what we think the possibilities are, being realistic about our asks. Yes, we have to compromise, but we don't compromise our core values. And I think we make it very clear about what we will not compromise on and what we will compromise on and making that distinction. And I think it's there. So this is a very important election that's coming up, as we've been talking about. And I think, again, we're three weeks away from it. We do not know who's going to win. Whoever it is that win, and, reg and who, regardless of who it is that does win, I think we have to stay focused on, on whichever administration it is, communicating with them in a way that is representative of who we are as Americans, who we are as people, and that is consistent with the majority of the American street. I think that's the pathway, if we do it right, and where we will begin to see America on a better pathway than where we are right now. So I was here, I think some of it, many of the people in this room were here uh, for the UCLA encampment last April. I believe it was the night of April 29th, uh, which is interesting because violence erupted at the encampment, but it was against the, the student protesters. And then the next day, the police came in and dismantled the encampment. And now, you know, there's a, I don't know what it's like here, is it, if it's Gestapo-like or what, but I, my understanding from USC, it's definitely like that there where you can't move without having a security monitor you have to disclose to them where you're going, who, you, who you're meeting, uh, and if you're having any guests. So we, we are eroding. And now uh, my understanding also is that the, the, the state is going to receive $300 million for more military hardware uh, to be uh, applied here on our campuses throughout the state of California. So how, how can we help the students in terms of, A, protecting their First Amendment rights? And Vanderbilt is a great university that talks about protest. You know, as a pillar of American democracy, we are, we are suppressing the right of people to petition their government, the right of protest, and, and they have done it peacefully. Um, and, and there's the vilification of, those, of these students. So how do we deal with this problem in terms of First Amendment rights, free speech, uh, and allowing the discourse to, to happen starting from our campuses? Because we feel that is the most important point to start a conversation for positive change. I mean, I, I guess the first thing I would say on that is that when you think... Of, so, so a lot of people ask the question of why is Palestine the issue? Why is Palestine the issue that matters? And 
I think one of the reasons, right, I mean, people say, look, there are so many conflicts in the world. There's Congo, there's Myanmar. Why is it Palestine? And it's actually one of the reasons that brings it back to, to this question of civil rights, because Palestine may have used to have been a foreign policy issue for the United States, something that really didn't impact uh, the majority of people in this country. It is now a question of civil rights. It is now the issue that has defined... Uh, and motivated the young generation. It is now the issue on which we see repression uh, being hung, whether against uh, freedom of speech, freedom of association, uh, all these other aspects. And so, you know, I think there is, first of all, let me just say, something to hold on to and hope for in that respect, because it has become this issue for so many. I was up in uh, Dartmouth College in the same time frame in April, May, uh, as the police were moving in to, you know, remove that encampment, and I was sitting in a classroom the next day, and, you know, student walked in, you know, with, like, you know, tattered jeans and hat on backwards and all that, and said, I don't care about the Middle East. I don't know the difference between Israel and Palestine. I don't care about, uh, you know, American foreign policy. But when you start arresting my friends, I care about that. And... That is one of the things, I mean, this is one of the lessons, right, of that America should have taken uh, from years of counterinsurgency, is that this is how you actually motivate a population to stand up. It's not that everyone is going to care about these issues. And so I think Palestine has become a linchpin, not only in the global foreign policy spectrum that we were talking about when it comes to, you know, the rules-based international order, where it was also a linchpin of whether accountability will function, whether that order will function, uh, but it is also a canary in the coal mine, or a linchpin, choose your metaphor, uh, for American civil rights. It is the cutting edge of where we are going in this country. Um, and so I think that the student issue is a really important one for us to address. I think the fact that it is becoming an issue is maybe the thing uh, that will actually lead to it being addressed and actually lead us forward uh, on the broader policy issue. I would just add to that, too. I think that's so important, everything you just said. And, and I don't have um, any edits other than just to add. And that would be um, that uh, showing your support for the Palestinian identity and for Palestinian rights does not have to come at the cost of something else. I think that's really important. It's actually going to that basic core of human humanity. And that goes back to these values and that goes back to the respect of dignity. And that's also part at the core of this as well. And I think that, that this narrative frame that, the, that a lot of the protests have been put under is false. And it's a false narrative. And so we actually need a truth-based narrative um, that allows for us to see things differently, allows, allows us also to reimagine what is possible. Um, and I would also just say, not even just reimagining what is possible in our country, but also reimagining what is possible around the world, including in the Holy Land. I mean, I think that many people don't even realize or know that almost one in four Israeli passport holders are Arabs, are Palestinians, and hold a Palestinian identity. Identity. So when we even talk about um, protecting uh, Israel, I wonder if maybe people even also realize that piece of it. And I also think about it in a from a comparative, um, you know, frame. If you think about talking about the United States, would you ever talk about the United States population now and not include our African American population? or not include our Latinx community or Hispanic community? Would we ever think to even do that? No, we would because we are also recognizing that we are a pluralistic society. And I don't think the Holy Land is different and that it can be the bedrock also as in an example for what a healthy pluralistic society could look like. And just one very practical thing that I think we need to really do, and that is make sure that students have a bright future. And what worries me sometimes when people are getting doxxed and when people are having their faces recorded and the technology is, is moving at a rapid pace in ways that could also criminalize their identities for decades to come and for their careers, that really worries me. And so I think we've got to make sure that their civil rights and civil liberties from the get-go are protected so that they're set up for success rather than being set up for automatic demonization and failure because that's not only that is hurting them and it's also hurting our country because this, these students are the best and the brightest and they're our future let's not set them up for failure let's figure out how to set ourselves up including them for success wonderful thank you uh do you
Last quick, quick question, though. Do you still recommend for some of these students to go into the field of policy and work in the United States federal government as... <laughs> don't shake your Only head if you know what you're doing. Yeah. Well, I mean, is, is that still a, a way of... Is that part of our theory of change, is to change the, the, the representation in the government so that Absolutely. more people uh, from... And it doesn't have to be Muslim. It could be those who understand and are connected. That's, that's one of the changes that has to be made. Do you encourage people to join the field of policy and government? I, absolutely. I think it's, 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 a, um, f it's, 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 a, it's a fascinating field. It's an incredible journey. And I also just to quote you on the interview that you did where you say, like, you know, you can drive more impact sometimes in a day than some people do in a lifetime. That's how you ended one of your interviews. And it's so powerful. It can be such, you can drive so much impact and make so many positive changes if you know what you're doing. So I wasn't trying to be just sort of like cheeky about that when I said it. You don't have to know what you're doing from the get-go. But try to hold yourself to a standard of intention integrity and, and, a, and a best practices standard of where eventually you will know what you're doing and you'll be very proud of it and you'll be ready to train the next generation. Yeah, and I would just add to that that, look, I mean, the work of government is going to get done uh, regard, regardless of whether it is done by conscientious people or automatons or worse. And so to say that, you know, with all the horrors we are seeing, this is not the time for conscientious people to get into government, I think is exactly the wrong answer. On the contrary, it's more important now than ever, given what we see, for people to go into government who care, who have a heart, who see other human beings. And yes, absolutely, there are compromises. And yes, there are things you should be thinking about. And if your red line is, you know, arms transfers, for example, maybe don't go work in the Bureau of Political Military Affairs. Uh, but even with those compromises, as you make along the way, there are still immense opportunities to do good but they will only be seized if someone is there to seize them. So please, absolutely, students, do pursue those careers. It really does matter, and we need you now more than ever. Well, thank you very much for Josh Paul, Summer Ali. Uh, I, want to say, I know Summer flew in to this morning at 10.45 a.m. Uh, from Nashville. She has to get back to her family, and she's... she's ready to get on a, a flight that connects through Phoenix, back to Nashville. I know TMI. But in any case, she, she, I just wanted to just underscore that, that you know, in terms of her commitment to be here with us, and we value it so much. We, we, well, and, I'm honored to be here. Yeah, and thank you. And we pray, and, and actually, and she's been working to, to evacuate her, some of her family members uh, from Lebanon, so I know there's a lot on her mind, and for her to that, have that clarity... Uh, and, and that uh, introspection in, in the discussion is, is quite amazing. So I thank you for being that. And, and Josh, thank you. thank you for all that you've done. And he's forming a new organization called uh, A New Policy. And if you're more interested, and if you're interested on that, I encourage you to talk to him uh, about, this, uh, about this new organization. That's also part of the theory of change, to, to get more advocacy into, into this issue, not just talk to ourselves and go to the protests and complain and that's it. But let's get all the people who are at the protests into these fields uh, and, 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 and make an impact in terms of policy. Uh, and lastly, you know, as we, as we said, impact is not endorsing. Quite frankly, nobody deserves our endorsement at this point. Uh, so, you know, c'est la vie. Uh, have fun. Uh, and uh, the, the real endorsement will come on election day and, and, and the real measure of success is when there should be a, a, a historic voter turnout of the Muslim community. That's when they will take us more seriously. So get out the vote, get more people registered to vote, and tell them to vote. Even if you don't vote at the top of the ticket, you can vote for LA City, you know, the city council, state, county. All these other measures are very important. Just get out the vote. Uh, and that's, that's the most important thing that we can do in terms of gaining political empowerment for our community. Thank you very much. Really appreciate your time. Thank you.